Welcome to SLP Nerdcast. I'm Kate. And I'm Amy, and we appreciate you tuning in. In our podcast, we will review and provide commentary on resources, literature, and discuss issues related to the field of speech-language pathology. You can use this podcast for ASHA professional development. For more information about us and certification maintenance hours, go to our website, www.slpnerdcast.com. SLP Nerdcast is brought to you in part by listeners like you. You can support our work by going to our website or social media page and contributing. You can also find permanent products, notes, and other handouts, including a handout for this episode. Some items are free, others are not, but everything is always affordable. Visit our website to submit a call for papers and come on the show and present with us. You can contact us anytime on Facebook, Instagram, or at info at slpnerdcast.com. We love hearing from our listeners and we can't wait to learn what you have to teach us. Just a quick disclaimer, contents of this episode are not meant to replace clinical advice. SLP Nerdcast, its hosts and guests do not represent or endorse specific products or procedures mentioned during our episodes unless otherwise stated. We are not PhDs, but we do research our material. We do our best to provide a thorough review and fair representation of each topic that we tackle. That being said, it's always likely that there's an article we've missed or another perspective that we haven't shared. If you have something to add to the conversation, please email us. We'd love to hear from you. So Amy, yes. <laughs> what are we talking about today? Uh, today we have the great pleasure of welcoming back Dr. Narissa Hall and Hillary Jellison. We're so excited. Thank you for coming back and talking with us again. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. We absolutely loved having you on the first time where we got to pick your brains and have you make all of us smarter about tele-AAC. Um, and we are so excited to have you back today for a new topic. Tele camp. Yes. So we are planning on talking to you today. We had the um, fortunate experience of being able to put our well established five week AAC camp into a virtual arena. And while it was a massive undertaking, it was really successful in many ways. And we've learned a lot. And we think that. There's a lot that we can continue to learn, and we're interested in sharing that with you and your audience. Well, we can't wait to hear more about it. Um, before we get started, do you, for the our listeners who didn't listen to the first episode, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourselves? Sure. Um, we are Communicare, which is an organization in Western Mass. Um, that provides AAC consultation and evaluations and therapy to students um, or to individuals within a school system, early intervention, um, and in some of the adult agencies. We also support assistive technology evaluations and consultation as well. That's awesome. awesome. <laughs> um, we're very excited for this. Before we get going, uh, the powers that be require that we read everybody's financial and non-financial disclosures. So everyone bear with us. Um, for financial disclosures, Hillary and Narissa are paid to provide consultation, intervention, training, and assessment in the areas of AAC, assistive technology, and tele-AAC. Uh, Kate, that's me, is the owner-founder of Grand Bois Therapy and Consulting, LLC, and co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. Amy is an employee of a public school system and also co-founder of SLP Nerdcast. Uh, nine financial disclosures. Hillary and Narissa are members members of ASHA's special interest group 12 and 18, as well as Resna. Kate and Amy are both members of ASHA SIG 12 and both serve on the AAC advisory group for Massachusetts Advocate for Chil Advocates for Children. Kate, again, that's me. Uh, <laughs> I am a member of the Berkshire Association for Behavior Analysis and Therapy, otherwise known as BABIT, Mass ABA or Mass ABBA, depending on how you want to pronounce that one, the Association for Behavior Analysis International, otherwise known as ABAI, and the corresponding special interest group, uh, Speech Pathology and Applied Behavior Analysis. It's just so long. There's it's just no way to make it shorter. No, it's, it's, we're just very, we're very disclosed now. <laughs> <laughs> Not disclosed, disclosed. No, just disclosed. Just in case anyone had a speech confusion there. It's a Friday afternoon. It's okay. fine. We're just going to keep going. Okay. So the learning objectives for today, we're really excited to get into it. Number one, list the three primary stakeholders um, involved in um, tele-AAC camp. Number two, detail strategies for addressing immersion. And number three, describe embedded icons and list three potential benefits of embedded icons. 
So I'm super excited. And this came up when we spoke last time just about the Tel AAC camp because that was still ongoing with you guys at that time. You were just getting ready to wrap it up. Um, and, and the whole idea of AAC camps in general are just so cool. Um, and there are, you know, a few of them that I've heard of at least throughout the United States. But I think, you know, there are so many benefits to just that experience in general, both as a client and a clinician. Uh, so the idea of translating something that you guys were already doing into this tele format is is really interesting and I'm so excited to hear you talk to us about it today. So I was wondering if you could start us off kind of setting this setting the scene and telling us just a little bit about that learning objective number one. Sort of who who are your primary stakeholders when you're running tele AAC camp and I guess maybe a little bit about, is that the same or is that different from when you've done it in the past face-to-face? -face? So we first started um, AAC camp many moons ago, about 11 years ago, I believe. Um, and it started with only about four or six campers. Um, and it was a parent who helped kind of um, push it and organize it together with us. So the goal was really that idea of we have kids that we see um, at, that use AAC, but they might be their only one in their class or their only one in their school sometimes. And so we wanted to create this um, camp opportunity where they were able to be with a group of other kids using AAC to have other models to um, see how it was working. And they each had a paraprofessional or support staff that came with them. Um, it started out where it was just, I think, two hours after their summer program. And then it's expands to us having 30 to 50 campers in a, um, a outdoor school um, environment um, where there's therapeutic horseback riding, there's swimming in a therapeutic pool, we go boating and fishing, we incorporated um, music therapy and an OT group and a PT group. And we've also used it as a placement for graduate students and for undergraduate students to learn about AAC. Um, so it's definitely expanded. I think our goal with it, that immersion of AAC for the, the students and the individuals is what we've achieved in that in person um, and supporting the communication partners. We wanted those communication partners to leave camp, which was following an um, extended school year. So it was for five weeks, four days a week, usually from nine to one, Monday through Thursday. Um, so we had an extensive amount of time with them, but we wanted those communication partners to learn basic AAC implementation strategies to then carry it with them beyond the camp. So when they went back to the um, school year, they were, they were comfortable and they were using the strategies they learned at camp. So those are kind of in that in person, our stakeholders were the campers, the communication partners who were primarily um, support staff through the schooling and um, the clinician. So it's that we had an open door policy. So their speech therapist might come and observe or their special educator may come and observe. Um, and those were our primary stakeholders that were involved in that support with our graduate clinicians. Um, and so when we looked at that tele model, we wanted to make sure we were carrying over our, our main goals, working on creating an immersive environment first individuals using AAC we were focusing on training our communication partners, uh, also focusing on training our graduate clinicians who were still involved in that, in that situation, um, in that tele, and still offering kind of that open door policy for some of the smaller individual sessions for clinicians from their school to come and observe. Who did I forget, Narissa? You definitely covered the stakeholders. And I think... Um, just to give a little bit of, um, first of all, Hillary created the first AAC camp in her brilliance, and it has since evolved and emerged um, into something really quite substantial from there. So she'll never claim it. And she so politely says we, but it was really her. <laughs> um, and I think something just in our general practice that has always been important, just when we think about AAC in general, we really think about it as this triadic three-way process. You just, you cannot simply, the, the communication partner is an imperative part of that process. Um, and 
and so you know we've always been really invested in supporting their training um, and their support and then we're also very committed to getting other people to feel really good about the feeling so i mean the getting other people to feel really good about aac and what it means to implement aac and and so that when we were originally tasked with putting our camp online we thought okay we can create a curriculum and um we can go and do that or we can say no to graduate students because the enormity of that is you know just a, a massive undertaking when we haven't done this before and we just realized that it wouldn't be camp and it wouldn't be as um pervasive and impactful if we didn't try to address those three and so, uh, those three stakeholders and i think we not only in our program but i think we feel very strongly that that is also implementation at large um, these are three primary stakeholders that need and when we say communication partner and we'll talk about that more um, today that doesn't necessarily mean a paraprofessional it could be a parent or a caregiver or a sibling um, but that it is really important that we not only have a professional like a clinician or an educator as well as a communication partner who is working super closely with the individual themselves so i think it's important to recognize that this is also camp but best practice for implementation and i think you know i'm sort of having two thoughts at once on the one hand i feel like camp in its very nature is an unstructured fun loving outdoorsy social bonding opportunity where you're connecting with people who are maybe from, de depending on where you go to camp, you know, they're part of your community or at sleepaway camp or you're connecting with other, there's such a, a rich social component to that. So the idea of AAC camp, I, I know that there are a handful of them, but they're, it's so rare and it's just so wonderful to sort of think about embracing communication partners outside of a directive therapeutic environment and more in a naturalistic fun. I keep saying fun. Camp was just always fun, you know, arts and crafts and, you know, adaptive sports and campfires and s'mores. I don't know all the things that you associate with camp. So bringing communication partners into a communication exchange that's rooted in some of those fundamental things and not in a, a clinical setting, I think is just so amazing. And then you take transitioning that to a virtual experience. So I keep seeing, you know, you know, on social media and hearing from my peers, you know, where um, we are recording this in the middle of COVID, where people have been forced to transition to telepractice without um, a lot of notice. And we're sort of just embracing it as we go along. And the silver lining there is this participation in a lot of ways of the caretakers, you know, because they're being able to, you know, the parents or whoever is in the home is able to participate, whereas before it was, you know, left to school or left to, you know, whatever professional was was driving the education. So now thinking about camp at with the communication partners in a telehealth model is, and to me, it's painting this totally comprehensive picture of embracing so many aspects of AAC that get left left on the wayside in our regular life. Yeah, and initially in in-person camp, we had made the rule that there were no parents as support staff, which I know sounds terrible and, and horrid, um, but we had had a few parents or grandparents as support staff and we re saw the struggle the students had with being able to shift kind of what their expectations were with their, with their parent um, or, or grandparent and what they were kind of in the school setting uh, or in the camp setting. We also had wonderful parents and grandparents that were paras in the past as well. Um, but, and I think as we're gonna talk more about the importance of the role of the communication partner and parents or siblings or grandparents in the tele, it really helped remind us that, no, we really need to reinforce and open this communication back up and support the understanding of the um, parents or the family as um, communication partners. You have a um, note here in the notes. You've used the word pre-professionals, which I don't think I've ever seen before. 
Is that graduate students? Yes. So those are our graduate students. Um, so, I like that. Yeah. They're on, on their way to their professional careers. That's wonderful. And I have to tell you, I mean, what an opportunity to learn and to, to involve people who are ambitious and just so open to gaining experiences. And then they come with their fresh perspectives and different ideas. And um, I mean, they are always an asset to a program. And I, I think Hillary and I will both agree enormously that they were even more so this time around too. So um, it's very, um, you know, it's, it's very much part of the process to involve them um, in learning. And just to go back, because Kate, there was something that you had mentioned just about the, the unstructured nature of camp. And I think um, part of, you know, I think what I try to encourage people when we talk about camp, yes, it's this kind of capsule of this little moment of time where we have free reign to explore and to be unstructured and have fun. And, and we often get met with feedback like, well, that's not what it's like in real life or, you know, that's not what it should be. And what we, you know, it should be like that in real life. And we, we worry so much about doing everything in these structured, you know, prescribed ways that especially when it comes to AAC and for some reason we just freak, I shouldn't say for some reason, but I think it also, one of the biggest challenges that we see in AAC implementation um, and actual AAC use is that initiation, that independence, that, that, you know, real authentic desire to take on this alternative system and to use it in a world that doesn't use AAC. And I think there's so much to learn that, yes, this is a five week program that is, you know, we have horseback riding and swimming, but there's still so much that we can take away into what would be programs throughout the year that do have structure. We can't do AAC if we don't have the fun, motivating, intrinsically motivating elements involved too. Um, so, and to piggyback on that, I mean, I feel like a lot of our learners who have complex bodies or complex communication needs, you know, they're, they might be in school for extended school year. And sometimes people just need a break. Sometimes kids need to have fun. You know, they need time to have to, to be kids or, you know, if they're, you know, older individuals, they need time to just be people and enjoy extracurricular activities. Um, and using to learn your device when horseback riding or swimming is, is part of life. I mean, I couldn't agree more. This is very inspiring stuff. <laughs> like thinking about my treatment in the last week, I'm like, oh man, it was so boring. I didn't go swimming. I didn't do any of these fun things. This just sounds awesome. It does. I can't imagine the amount of, of work that went into making it happen and has gone into making it happen. Like I really can't. Um, but I think a couple of things that I, that you guys made me think about when you were describing the camp was this piece of, you know, as somebody who's in a role, who's working to support other people, um, who's working to support communication partners in learning strategies and skills, um, is that like that structure also makes it easier, right? It's easier to say like, this is this very prescriptive thing that you do and first you do this and then you do this. Um, and, and that's a nice place maybe sometimes to initially learn those skills, but it's a lot harder to kind of model and support people in using those skills spontaneously. So what a great way to mesh these two things. Like, hey, people do fun things in life. Here's how you could incorporate it. It's just, it's, it's so cool. And I think when you think of um, camp, you think of like your group that you're in. Like we, each year we have a um, different theme to how we're naming each groups. Um, this year we took a tech theme, surprise, surprise. But <laughs> like it creates the goal, you know, camp creates this small group um, opportunity for communication, for wait time, for commenting and increasing that social interactions. And, and we don't necessarily see that with some of our kids. They're in one-to-one -one sessions or in the classroom, it's set up in one-to-one, -one, you know, cubbies. Um, but that, that small group opportunity really facilitates that communication piece. I think another big piece that connects with that is the idea that we also learn vocabulary. We learn everything better when we can attach it to a prior experience. 
Um, so just being able to have more diverse experiences as a learner, being able to go horseback riding and be able to communicate while you're riding the horse or going fishing. Um, I think that that's probably also helping to create experiences where your clients and their partners are able to see like, oh, okay, that this, this is doable. And I can remember now they'll, they'll leave camp always having that memory of having done that before and having it be successful. And I think that that's a really cool gift that you're, you're helping, you're giving them. And not, not to get all ABA on it, but it's reinforcing. It's fun. I mean, the, it, it just makes sense. I mean, it's just a very common sense thing, you know, and, and, you know, hashtag science, that's something that's reinforcing would increase the probability of it happening in the future, you know? So I think especially for our more complex learners or individuals with complex bodies, again, you know, extended school years, lots of structure, so many teaching opportunities, the opportunity to learn language in a naturalistic and fun setting is so special and reinforcing. I mean, it's just like, it just makes sense. I was going to say duh, but that sounded a lot less smart. So I'm going to say that it just makes sense. <laughs> also, 50 campers is so many campers. I know. So many campers. That's so many. Nobody can see my face, but when you said 50 campers, my drop, my mouth popped open. I'm just impressive. So we learned that year that that is too many campers um, <laughs> because you just aren't are you aren't able to do the same level of intense support that you want to do for every single kiddo. And so we learned that was too much. So I have a question. What would you say before we moved on to some of these other things about um, immersion and, and icons, um, and embedded icons, in terms of the communication partners, um, what would you say are the, the, the areas where the communication partners needed more support in terms of an unstructured camp-like setting, as opposed to, I mean, I know partner training is huge. We always want to be supporting our communication partners, but was there something about the unstructured nature of quote camp that you found to be um, an area where they needed a little bit more support? Um, oftentimes it was kind of the prompting, like knowing that we were, we, it was all speech therapists leading it. We were going to wait. There was plenty of wait time. There wasn't a rush to get to the next thing or um, so getting the communication partners with comfortable with kind of stepping back without jumping right in for that prompting because they knew they only had, they had to answer quickly before maybe some of the other kids who were more verbal or impulsive kind of interacted. Um, and I think that the bigger thing with the communication partners was that we were focusing on them. Like camp to us, they were just as important as the camper that they were with. Oh, so awesome. I'm jealous. I, I want to go to this camp. That sounds so cool. I want all my students to go to this camp. Please, please. That sounds come. amazing. You're like, but 50 is too many, maybe next year. Uh, well, we're, we, we're working on saying <laughs> no, no room at the end. <laughs> because they know us. So then you talk to the parent or you get to hear or you meet the student and it's really hard to say no. So you guys should right, start your yeah. own AAC camp out there. And oh, sure. You. That's no problem. I can do that. That's no big deal. Um, so in terms of this many kids, so you have, you know, let's, for the sake of using a round number, you have 50 kids. Um, when you break that larger number down into smaller groups, how did you match the campers in their groups? Um, so with many years of experience, we have learned um, we try to max match somewhat by grade or age, but we're also looking at a, ability. Um, but we within the campers, you have we have ages of three or four up to 22. And so some of our 22 year olds are coming back as like counselors in training. But oh, some of awesome. So we ended up kind of doing like a preschool group or a preschool elementary group. Um, you know, a middle school group and a high school or older kids group. We also had a group of kids who really needed a lot of movement. Those were some of our kiddos that maybe had more intensive behavior um, plans that we wanted to make sure we had that flexibility within, within that group. But we definitely have kiddos in the middle that we might move up even based on their literacy skills. So if they're in the age social group, 
with the elementary school or high elementary school group, but they were had real strengths within literacy or that higher level of written expression, we might pop them into the older group for those certain type of writing and reading activities. That's really that's cool. awesome. Yeah. I think, well, I mean, I think just trying to think about that, that's something that's challenged. I can think back to multiple work environments, but particularly when I've been in school-based environments, you know, if, if you're trying to group students and then being able to do that differentiated instruction within the group, those are, those are real challenges. And so the way that we helped in our preparation for it is um, we had organized different activities and, and lessons that they would run, but then we would differentiate each lesson in three different ways. So in the three different ways, it was based on the same way that we differentiated our vocabulary we chose. So our emerging communications had communication students had more concrete vocabulary and a smaller subset. Next level had that initial base vocabulary and then added a few more to it. And then your last group, the third differentiation, had all of the vocabulary. They may have more examples or um, more turns within the activity than some of the others because within one group just because you had the elementary school group didn't mean every learner was at the same level so we wanted to have the material already differentiated or a plan in, in place so the student who was maybe at the emergent level could still participate in a game or an activity with a student that was at the higher level and just their materials looked slightly different than the others can you talk a little bit about how that looks different or the same relative to your face-to-face -face groups? Is that is that a similar structure that you would use when you were doing face-to-face -face camp or did you feel like it was a little bit more prep for Tela? So in face-to-face -face camp is when we did the three-way differentiation. And so we carried that over into the telecamp. Um, it looked slightly different because in telecamp, we would do a group, like a group morning meeting and have some small group sessions and then have some individual tele sessions. So we, we were differenti differentiating, whew, tricky, um, through the materials with vocabulary, but our group session was more of our general, it may not be individualized specifically for those supports, but then in the small group or the individual sessions, we were able to really tailor it down to um, that differentiated piece of it. Looping back to um, when you were talking about the materials, I think that's a good segue into our second learning objective, detail strategies for addressing immersion, which includes embedded icons, themed weeks and language boards and things. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. So um, I, you know, it's hard to see, but my eyes widened when we talked about the, you know, the amount of prep or if it was more prep was needed in telecam. First of all, this was obviously our first time doing it. So we didn't really know what to expect, but in terms of preparing, yes, but where what has what seems to be so valuable is that that was worth it because what we've since learned and i'll come back to your um the objective but what we've since learned and we'll probably get to talking about again is that the combination of live synchronous sessions with store and forward pre-recorded asynchronous sessions really starts to help balance the heterogeneity of the heterogeneity, I think, of the camp, the, the, the population that we're working with. Every single person, irrespective of their system being used, is very, very different. And so we needed this menu of choice. Um, so a lot of prep went into it, but I think it really resulted in some pretty impressive outcomes in the sense of how people either took to it or what they liked or, or what was meaningful for them and what that meant to have these really targeted resources. So to that point of how did we address immersion? What did we, what did we do with these different tools? So we, we, um, we started with wanting all of our materials as best possible to embed icons. Um, some of them we differentiated across AAC systems. So we would work with symbol sticks or, you know, 
um, Pixons and LAMP PRC type icons. Um, and we didn't necessarily worry as much about the sequence or how you would access those. So it really wasn't intended as a visual prompt, but more of a, hey, this stuff includes the same kind of things that you see on your system. It, I mean, very similar to you see words and we write with words and we read words. Well, we see icons and we read, you know, we they start to level the playing field or bring to life AAC in the context of the materials that we're we're using. So we created materials with embedded icons. So we would overlay icons um, that related to our theme, as well as some general concepts that we were working with. Do more, stop, why, um, I like it, you know, and, and so they would not necessarily, the intention not to be uh, necessarily a prompt for the individual to be expressive, um, but an exposure addressing that kind of psychosocial element of feeling like the way that you communicate is very much part of the it's you know hillary kind of co coins it as um tele the environmental um, engineering for the tele environment basically um and it's just you know preparing the materials creating opportunities um and we'll talk to the success of those but just to continue to go so we had these embedded icons in our general um, activities and then we would have language boards there's mixed there are mixed thoughts and feelings about language boards out there why we like to use them in the context of our camp is again for depending on the, the goal of the task it might just be to facilitate participation to comment that that is a tractor but maybe you don't have tractor in your device um, we still are focusing on language and basic language in general, but there's some things that are really critical for quick, ready participation. Um, I'm sure I said it in the last time we met, I think in Venn diagrams, there's a part in the middle where we all have to overlap and then it gets differentiated on the outskirts, but that middle part is represented in these icons and the set of vocabulary. And to be able to meld and meet in that middle, we need things like language boards. So that was kind of our step up. And for the sake of our listeners, I think language boards are some, I've heard them often referred to as topic boards, but that's essentially the same thing, right? So you have a set of fringe vocabulary with, I assume, maybe some core vocabulary related to, specifically related to the task at hand. Exactly. Yes. So a whole bunch of icons specific to the topic with core vocabulary so they could be combined and we could have language it's not just choice making or labeling it can extend beyond that and we may also have things like awesome wow something different so some of that general language that's not necessarily too too topic specific um i think that 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 also makes me think about you know the comment that you mentioned as far as it could, that your goal might not always be vocabulary acquisition. And I think sometimes that's confusing for people too. That's um, such a good point. So in the example of a topic board in that moment is not necessarily to teach tractor. Your goal is just that social experience, the social moment and the social rule of when somebody says something to you, you can take a turn. And I, I feel like for me, at least sometimes those pieces get a little bit lost or they get somehow deprioritized when they're actually super important because back to Kate's point about reinforcement and doing it again in the future. Aha, I ABA'd you. you ABA'd it's it's impossible to not do it. Um, but I think, you know, like those nice social moments, symbolic linguistic communication aside are what makes us motivated to continue to communicate with other people. I communicate with you because it makes me feel good. Um, and if I don't have a robust vocabulary, my opportunities to get that experience of feeling good by sharing some type of interaction with somebody else are very limited. Uh, so I think that, that I mean, I, I agree. I think that topic, topic boards or language boards can be great for that. They have their place. And I think one of the things that we've learned in our old age is that, um, <laughs> light tech or wisdom people, not old age wisdom, wisdom. in our wisdom, <laughs> wisdom is that light tech or low tech paper-based supports are highly highly efficient and helpful and there isn't this priority piece of it um, we're still able to focus on 
that communication piece of it. And sometimes people over focus on the technology and our, our goal isn't just to be cool technology people, but is our, it is to be communication. I want to know just doing so many of that, like aggressive head nods and enthusiasm arms because yes, that's so true. And I think, yeah. And that's also, you know, another one of the tools that we created were very generalized communication cards that really, it was, wow, that's awesome. You know, I just cool. Uh, I think we talked about them before, but though they were also, you know, to be able to help support the um, just social pragmatic elements of engaging in these live sessions. So we kind of created um, supports that kept communication at the forefront, um, you know, and knowing that we're also working on concept development and language and things and things like that. Um, and then we really feel strongly, and I know we've talked about this, but just really going in, creating those contexts each week with a new theme, we kind of lived, breathed, felt that theme. Our clinicians would dress up in accordance with that theme. The activities would be... This is so fun. Oh, so fun. And then we were... I like feel terrible for all of my students and clients who don't do... I don't dress up. This is so fun. I mean, you should have seen the traction of outer space. I mean, we threw it in there kind of in our own like, what? And it it turned out to be a favorite for so many people, Um, you know, and they came on with you know, green screen and overlays of astronaut helmets. And, you know, they just, I think it really created a space and a shared space. The the themes and the thematic, the vocabulary and the ability, again, it's not necessarily on your system, but we have these embedded icons and we have these language boards. So we are all just living and breathing this shared concept, this shared theme for the week together which is again, representative of life, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have shared experience and shared communicative context everywhere you go all the time. You, you know, I I think that it's so, so, this is another one of those things that gets lost. I mean, I feel like we're making a little list here, you know, of, of all of the things that we forget that you have been able to highlight through an unstructured camp experience uh, that's so incredibly valuable. So did you, did you already say how you chose the themes? Um, we chose them by overthinking a lot. Um, like that. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> but we also looked back at um, previous themes. So in camps history, we started out with weekly themes and then we went to picking a book per week and that kind of directed our theme. And then we went to kind of following the curriculum the unique curriculum theme because so many students were familiar and we figured it would give a good anchoring for when they went back to school. Um, And so we kind of chose week by week based off of switching things up for students in that way in case one student didn't love the theme, they got to kind of change it up. That's awesome. Themes make camp so fun. Agreed. Agreed. You know, I, I feel like it doesn't, I don't know, maybe we should Maybe I should be doing more themes in my my regular school year. I don't know. But I feel like that gives you such a nice backdrop to draw from. And it's not, again, going back to Amy's point, it's not just about the vocabulary. It's about the shared, so much more about the shared experience and um, connecting with people around a common a common element. And I think it also sets in motion a better... Um, generalization plan. So as part of our curriculum, we were able to also suggest movies to watch that related to the theme, books to read that related to the theme. I love that. We included extension activities um, that showed also just how to incorporate AAC outside of these activities. So we tried to really um, use it and set examples from it rather than have it be like a standalone, like once you've done it, you're doing it. Um, but to push people to think and start to create their own ideas because if they're constantly just taking what we're giving, so we give a little starter and say, now run with it. And I think what we know, 
what we read, what we know is that we're going to do best with learning and motivation if we can relate it back to the student. So many of our complex learners need information that's relatable to them or need to find this anchoring where they can build this association. So with each week's theme, that was part of the curriculum that was embedded within there. It's not just, let's learn about outer space and all this other stuff, but outer space also means the sky and the moon and the fact that at night the moon comes out and the stars are there or the sun rises. And um, so trying to relate each of the activities kind of to something that they could associate or relate to, as well as expanding their concepts and of the different themes. And I think with that too, because you're working with students, you know, you're working with school age individuals, you're also giving some nice preview to connect with later science lessons or other activities, you know, in which your students may or may not be a part of that instruction. And I feel like science in particular is just science is all around us. And it's, it's such an engaging multi-sensory thing to learn about. So Amy, what a great segue to talk about how in camp, in the virtual, again, we wanted to take that fun excitement of our in-person camp and bring it over to the teleside. And so one of our, we had specials. So we had a rec pre-recorded music therapy, an OT session that was more art, the very like fine motor art based. We had Zumba sessions pre-recorded and we had Oh, a yoga based PT session. And then um, I recorded with my sons a science experiment each week session going along with your science. And if you think of the core vocabulary, the language opportunities, commenting, science is unpredictable. And so there was great communication opportunities in there. And then we also did, um, they, the boys did a cooking um, lesson each week, which again kind of pulled those in. Um, and Sorry, Nursa. Thank you, Hillary. I just <laughs> thought again, because we have a picture of what this looks like. So I think just um, just creating a picture too. So we had all of this stored in one spot, um, almost like a, a little a classroom space. And going back to this kind of immersive element, we set the stage with a pre-recorded morning check-in that set the stage. This is, hey, it's Monday, even though it was probably, you know, recorded on Sunday, but we wanted to cry, kind of create an anchor in the day that felt as if you came to camp. So every day, every day on our website um, followed the same theme, a check-in, a reminder for your 10 o'clock group Zoom, um, and then to check your schedule for your other, your other, um, sessions that you might have. And then we would also have a learning activity for that day, which was pre-recorded themed activity that had these embedded icons that was connected to the theme and it differed Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then we would have um, the special for that day. So our specials were, um, you know, PT on Monday, OT fine motor art on Tuesday, music on Wednesday, and then Zuma, Zumba on Thursday. So we had almost like a routine to it. And then we would have as part of that whole unit, the related cooking, science experiment, as well as two extension activities. So they did not stay the same. It would be, you know, how do you do a scavenger hunt and embed AAC? How do you, um, you know, go swimming and embed AAC? And we, you know, so we'd kind of give, they weren't, encompassing lessons, but there would be examples of extending that and generalizing AAC use. And then, as I mentioned, we would have things like related books and related videos. So we really tried to have this structure, I think that kind of set the physical context, even though we were in a remote environment, and then the theme kind of created the cognitive context and shared space that then allowed us to really be connected as learners, as friends, as, you know, as partners in it. And so it kind of was this layered, established thing that I think to that point of how did we create this immersiveness? Um, and then 
each that structure changed for each theme. And so then we would have an amazing connected, you know, when it was outdoor hiking, camping theme, the cooking recipe was trail mix and um, the art activity was painting rocks. And, you know, so it, they, even the specials were also connected. So it kind of really brought to life um, this theme across multiple different contexts. So it sounds like you had that overarching, I guess I'll, I'll call it like an organizational structure, right? With your pre-recorded morning message, you have your check-in, you've got your reminder for your Zoom or your other sessions. And then a lot of asynchronous materials that are being provided. Um, and that structure maintained throughout all of camp. Yes. And then your theme would rotate weekly and that kind of shifted the content that was all thematically linked, but within this general organizational structure, I think that's, yes. that was probably helpful for campers and partners, right? Cause we all, I mean, one thing I'm struggling with right now in COVID times is a lack of that organizational structure. I just want to know what yeah. my day looks like. I want to know what's expected of me because when you're sending all of this mental load to understanding the structure and it's always different, having variety can sometimes be taxing. Yeah. Well, and I can I can only imagine, and I guess I'm saying this as a clinician, but also a parent, you know, when you're doing telepractice, tele-AAC, you know, you have these sessions, they have finite beginnings and ends. And, you know, you log in, you do your work, and then you go about your life. But what you're talking about is so much more immersive and continuous. Um, and I, I feel like that theme just, you know, bring having a theme connect all of these things together, I feel like I have to assume made it a bit easier for people to more deeply participate instead of, oh, I got to log in for my, my, my therapy session, or I got to go do, you know, whatever. There was so much more. I, I just have to imagine there was more connectedness there. I think so. We feel so. We, well, I, we haven't yet run the data analysis, but I think Hillary and I, and in interviewing and working with participants, I think that that was very much shared. Um, and I suppose this is a nice segue into our third and final learning objective. Describe embedded icons and list three potential benefits of the embedded icons. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So the I probably merged them a little bit and talked a bit, um, but it I think it goes to a larger a larger understanding about what it means to be an individual using AAC in a speaking world. Um, and I think, you know, we feel really strongly about creating a community of connectedness and feeling and part, I mean, we reflected on where this started as an opportunity for individuals to kind of see other individuals. And I remember early on, we would have, you know, we had a little girl who's not so little anymore come in and just be completely shocked that there was another person with the same color talker that used it. And it was like her world would just, she all of a sudden felt, I think that she wasn't my, as my I, heart just exploded Oh, I my know. heart and my brain just exploded. <laughs> I, I, I am like, I'm not going to cry, but that, that you, the, you describing that moment, that is amazing. I, I will never forget it. And I, you know, I won't tell you who the name is, but I know who she is. Like, you know, of all the hundreds of people that we've worked with over the years, I'll tell you exactly who she is. Cause I'll never forget that. Um, you know, and for myself, I think about when I travel, you know, you go and you can fumble your way through, especially if they you know, someone's speaking a different language and you're gesturing and you're doing your best. And I remember going to Paris and being so surprised at the lack of English and feeling really isolated. And then when I would get that subtitle or someone that could speak English, I was like, oh, I like immediately felt a sense of acceptance and relief and okay, we can connect. And I think that that's a lot about where it comes down to environmental engineering for us. Like bring these systems to life. You know, these individuals are, are really isolated in so many ways and it doesn't matter how you know how much we say you know have AAC present it's a very different thing to have AAC embedded AAC in your environment just like a subtitle on a sign so we you know we 
we feel strongly in things like environmental labels and um, you know embedded icons, and we we know that there's information to say like that's not the way to read like teach reading or you don't make the connection like we know all that. What we look at it is the psychosocial benefits of that connectedness. The, my way of communicating is much as part of this environment, and so we um, you know I think that's our 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 heart story as to why we spend time embedding icons. Um, and then I think what we also see is that, again, not as a visual prompt for expressive output for the individual, but it starts to help. We take for granted what we know as, as skilled clinicians, of what we know about modeling and parsing out vocabulary and emphasizing and being reiterative. And, you know, like we just talk naturally, like, you're right that is a bird and the bird is in the sky, you know, we do that intuitively. But when we start to embed these icons, we start to cue communication partners into, hey, that's an opportunity to point to that icon and emphasize that vocabulary word and use that to expand on something. So an icon is just an icon or a few icons. It's not a whole sentence. It's not intended to be like, you know, I see a red bird, it might be bird or turn or what. Um, and so we have that not only in our tangible materials, but also in our, um, you know, pre-recorded video based materials. And to jump off of that, the embedded icons, just like we strongly feel in most things was not ver was not just nouns. You know, the embedded icons were the different functions of communication that we were also working on. So there were yikes, or like Nurse said, what? Oh my, uh oh, or or it was maybe some concepts that were more noun based that were some of the vocabulary, but it was really another way of that communication partner. Visuals are important for all of us, whether we're the communication partner or the individual. And it was just another way of kind of prompting and reminding that piece of it. I think that that's such a good point. I think we lose sight as skilled clinicians of the level of embedded visual supports that we have in our daily lives and how often we use visual supports with one another for everything. Um, and we don't call them visual supports, but I think once you start seeing it, you see it everywhere. If you, you know, really look for it and then consider what an AAC user is, is missing in terms of, I mean, your example is amazing in terms of thinking of it as a language system and being in a, in a country where they don't speak your primary language and then making that connection with a symbol. I, I think this, and the word that you used psychosocial connectedness. That is so, so huge. And, you know, I think a lot of times we talk about modeling and aided language modeling and people thinking it of as a teaching strategy or instruction, you know, thinking of it as like an instructional modeling instead of, no, it's that, it's that connected piece. It's saying to someone, I'm going to do this with you. And I, I think the idea of embedded icons as a way of supporting that is just, it's magic. I'm feeling very inspired. <laughs> it's just really magical. I agree. And I, I think that sometimes, you know, I've, I've talked a lot amongst my colleagues about, you know, sometimes the research that you read, it, it takes, it takes some time to sit with it, to understand how it connects with your clinical practice. And so the point that you made as far as the embedded icons, and we know the research and it's not the best way to teach people how to read. I think that sometimes what happens is you go to a conference and you hear that and what you walk away with is not, okay, there's a better way to focus on developing literacy skills. What you walk away with is kind of this like dichotomous black and white thinking, okay, embedded icon's bad, right? And that's, that's not the message that you wanna bring away, but sometimes the research, um, due to the nature of research, and we were all in grad school, we took research methods, but like, I, I think that can be a challenge in our field. I feel like we see it with core and fringe vocabulary too. Sometimes people go to a conference and they walk away saying, whoa, I just have to use core words. Well, that, that's, it's much more nuanced than that. That is, that is not the big takeaway. But sometimes um, I think that what happens is we get a little confused as clinicians. And if we're getting confused as clinicians, then it must be even more confusing for people who didn't go to grad school for this, right? Uh, so I, I would love to see us more. I mean, I think a theme going through this conversation that we've had with you guys here today is the idea that 
there are all of these different dimensions of communication and it's important for us to think about and talk about and be explicit about not just the words and not just the morphology. Um, and I, I have one more comment and then I guess a last question. Um, in terms of what you're saying about this black and white thinking and reading the literature and, and coming away with like a rule, right? So I have, I'm supposed to use this now because this is evidence-based practice. I think you are hitting the nail on the head and really getting at that nuance of where science meets art. So, you know, what we do as clinicians is sometimes gray, you know, it is creative. It has that component of of engagement and connectedness, and that doesn't have a sciencey flavor, but we're sub, you know, supporting it with these individualized decisions rooted in some science, you know, rooted in a, an article that, or maybe not that article, the other article, because it wasn't about this population. You know, there's so many individualized decisions that, that go into that. Um, yeah, and I think that that's yes. clinical judgment, right? That's why we are here that's why we're trained we're trained to apply what we know and then i think just knowing about evidence-based practice is as much that internal evidence too so are is what you're doing effective and i think when hillary's always done such a great job of just being like okay ask yourself what's the goal of the task because when the goal of the task is just to have someone feel connected boom embedded icons when the goal of the task is to teach them reading we'll do a different strategy it's not one size fits all. And I think we sometimes forget that there's going to be this modulation across the, depending on what we're trying to address. And when the goal of the task is to help people feel immersed and connected, we're going to be embedding icons. I think that's, that's brilliant. Um, my final question before we wrap up, now that you guys have done this in person and you've done it over tele, um, through like a, the, through a telepractice medium, what were some things that worked and what were some and and what were some things that what didn't work and what will you do different differently um what worked was that we had amazing communication partners at the end and the amount of parents that said you know i think you guys said this but the fact that the communication break partner can make or break the success, like I'm really feeling that now. Like I feel like you've given us a lot of tools, whether they're, you know, light tech or strategies that we're gonna take and continue to move forward with it. Um, so I think having the combination of the learning kits, the visuals, making sure those were in hand, making sure that, you know, it also helps our practice moving forward. We need to be so much more explicit when we're talking to communication partners about what our expectations are, um, as well as what is that AAC strategy that maybe we're gonna really focus on this time. Um, and that it's possible, it's so possible to have fun and to create this social connectedness in a virtual opportunity with a variety of learners at different levels and abilities. Um, so that was exciting. Yeah, I think to Hillary's point, what worked, I think, and what came right at the start of this was tele providing an opportunity to involve, really deeply involve a range of people. Um, I think that really worked. Um, there were certainly things that we couldn't teach our grad students, for example, about, you know, simultaneously managing behaviors in and also addressing needing to program that button potentially, you know, there was a lot of stuff that was a little bit different and we were very transparent about what we can't teach you and what we we can um and you know i think that that was something that didn't work but we were there were elements that really did work and tele as we're looking at each of us now you are hyper focused on certain elements and a lot of our teams reflected on being able to address language much more quickly because they were in this kind of really controlled and, environment. Um, sort of to something that didn't work. Our initial thought, if you were to talk to us in end of April, May, about what our virtual camp was gonna look like, we were going to do four days a week, nine to, nine to one. It was gonna be straight live. Like it was gonna be so intensive and we're like, yes. And then, we had a couple of weeks of actual tele school support and realized 
there's no way this is going to happen. Like our communication partners had siblings or they were working or they had a phone they were watching us on, not on a computer, or they didn't have all these other things. And so we had to adjust our picture of what camp was going to look like virtually. And that's where the asynchronous tele, um, tele AAC came into play because it allowed us to provide intensive material and support for the campers and their communication partner, but offer that flexibility for um, the parents and for the families to be able to access the live sessions, but also be able to get the recorded asynchronous support or if on that day they had a rough day, they could access that um, asynchronous kind of support later on when it worked for them. That all sounds amazing. <laughs> I, I I am feeling like I am in awe of all of this. It sounds like a tremendous amount. It's a huge undertaking, but also so worth it. I mean, you're this is this sounds like an experience that is second to none that so many I'm sure of your campers haven't had before. Or, you know, that so many individuals don't have access to a camp where you're being immersed in an AAC system. So I am, I'm literally feeling very inspired and a little bad about the summer that a lot of my students have, but that's fine. Maybe next summer is different and, 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 and I'll send them out to you guys. <laughs> but I think that we can also re recreate so many of these elements and the school year or in different, you know, I so think true. there's a lot that, I mean, we got to really delve into it and explore and we had the flexibility to, to do that. But in starting to work with teams as we now re-envision what it looks like still in COVID as we start a new school year, there are a lot of these things that we're trying to encourage teams to incorporate. Um, and, you know, I think the flexibility and the involvement of stakeholders, the, the, the routinization so that people can get into the groove, things that we know, um, but what we got to experience in camp was that we can still do it in a tele-environment, um, and we should, because it really helps make it more successful. Are there any, before we wrap up, are there any resources that you all have? I know your website is is chock full of resources. Are there any camp specific resources that you want to highlight or talk about or direct our listeners to? And we will put them up on the episode page and in the show notes. Um, well, we are also putting together a visually based webinar of similar stuff. So that's yes. the next one. Your webinars up. are the best. I don't know if you know, but I have a fan. <laughs> your biggest fan. Amy's Amy. your biggest fan. <laughs> so we're going to have that um, that's coming. And I think we're trying to potentially wrap our minds around about having the curriculum be more available because now that it's over, I mean, the more people that can either see it as an example or have it. So I think coming soon, um, as well as, you know, there will be an upcoming webinar for sure. And you guys are ASHA CE providers. So presumably there will be ASHA CEUs offered for said webinar, which is awesome. Um, and we will list all of those things on the episode notes, uh, in the show notes on the episode page. Um, and our listeners can contact you through your website. There's a nice little box that says contact us. I've spent a lot of time on your website, so I know where that is. Anything else before we wrap up? Other than thank you to both of you. Um, no, you're welcome. You guys pretty much stole the show. It was awesome. <laughs> as, as usual. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us. We hope you learned something here with us today. Don't forget if you would like a handout, there are handouts available for this episode um, on the episode page. And uh, you can use this episode for one ASHA CMH, which is equal to 0.1 ASHA CEU. Uh, and thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> <laughs>